There's a lot of people writing about the threat to our Western way of life, our Western liberties. But a woman who has moved from merely talk and writing to action is our dear friend Pamela Geller, who joins us from New York City. Hey, Pamela, welcome back to the show. Hey, Ezra, thanks for having me. Now, we've talked about a lot of particular fights you fought over the years to stop the Ground Zero Victory Moss that was proposed. The, the fight, uh, uh, for example, uh, t for freedom of speech to criticize radical Islam on, in ads in subway stations. But before we talk about those specific fights, I want to ask you, what turned you into an activist? What made you not just a blogger, but someone who's going to organize, fundraise, and fight? Well, it's interesting. Of course, it's all been very organic, Ezra. Even the blogging was a result of 9-11 and the media's dereliction of duty in the reportage of critical events. Um, I would say that it was very uh, natural. I would cover these rallies that the media wouldn't cover, these anti-Bush rallies, these virulent anti-Israel uh, uh, rallies. But I would say that the very first real action-oriented initiative was for a Canadian girl. Uh, Aksa Parvez, I'm sure you recall, uh, was uh, suffocated, killed by her brother and her father uh, because she wanted to lead a Western, a more Western life, and they would spy on her and saw she wasn't wearing the hijab in school. It was all a, quite a terrible story. But what struck me was that a year after her death, she was laying in an unmarked grave, plot 774. It, it, it irked me, it, it devastated me that this girl, not only had we failed her, in life, but we had failed her in death. And it started a journey where I was raising funds just to get her a headstone. And that became a story, even though initially I didn't report it. I just wanted the money, and we designed this headstone that said, you know, Aksa Parvez, beloved, remembered, and free. And the cemetery w was making all the preparations. And then at the last minute, they said, we, we, I'm sorry, we can't, we can't uh, install the stone. I was like, why? They said, because the family has to uh, approve it. And I called the family. And I said, look, I'll make whatever changes you want to make, and so on and so forth. And they said, we don't speak English, and hung up the phone. And so I realized at that point they were not going to accept this act of benevolence. And so I said to the cemetery owner that I would buy a, a plaque or a tree or a rock. And they said, I'm sorry, you, you can't do that. I said, I'll buy the plot next to it. I'll raise the money and buy the plot next to it. They said, sorry, you can't do that, because it was owned by the Islamic Society of North America. And thus became a journey. And it really became a teaching, a teachable moment for me that nothing was simple in this fight, that you would be demonized in this fight. I had readers in Canada go looking for other places. We found the University of Guelph and Arboretum there. And one of my readers was a horticulturalist. They designed the whole garden of trees that bloomed all different seasons, all different flowers, different years. And at the last minute, I got a letter. I'm sorry, we can't do this. It's political in nature. Just remembering a girl. Hmm. Be, was political in nature. Unbelievable. So that's, to, to, yeah, just to answer your question, not to get too tangential, I'm sorry, no. but understand, that was how my activism was was initially shaped, and yeah. I saw how critical it was. Yeah. Uh, your and, and, and your so activism, you, you had an act of remembrance and love, and you were responded to with Sharia hate, by a cemetery saying never, and even a secular university saying never. Now, Aksa Parvez is not the only young Muslim girl you have tried to help break free from Sharia. Tell me about Rifka Berry and some of the other cases you've worked for. I mean, I'm not talking about just politics. I'm talking about trying to help individual women. Well, Rifka Berry is a case where there's no doubt in my mind that we saved that girl's life. Uh, this was a girl, a young, a young Christian convert out of Islam in Ohio, who had converted, was a convert for years. She was 17 years old. The Noor Mosque, a uh, terror-linked mosque in uh, Columbus, had sp spied on her and called her parents and said, your daughter converted out of Islam. You straighten her out or else. That's a direct quote. And her father threatened to kill her. As you know, she ran away. And I had heard from her friends. Her friends wrote to me and said, oh, we think we, she met a bad end. And I got to tell you, Ezra, those stories never have a good ending, mm. ever. So when I heard she was alive in Florida and I watched the media descend like vultures, on, on uh, uh, you know, a carcass to destroy her, to marginalize her, to ruin her reputation. A young, sweet girl, 17-year-old girl, because she had converted out of Islam. And so I had gone to Florida, 
to live cover the hearings to bring her back to that deadly household. And it's interesting because when I was in Florida covering her hearings, it's when I saw the buses proselytizing for Islam, come to Islam, you know, why Islam? And I remember thinking, what about those that are trying to leave Islam? And that's where the initial bus and ad campaign idea came from. It came out of the Rifka Barry fight. Um, and we held rallies outside the court there in Florida when she was transferred back to Ohio, which, I mean, it, it floored me. Here we have millions of girls in America who have run away doing drugs, selling their bodies, nobody cares. But here's a nice little virgin who ran away from home to for her, save her own life, and the whole world is looking for her. So um, I think by applying the heat and by the legal counsel that she had, that we saved that girl's life. And she currently, as you know, is, you know, living in hiding, but living a free, relatively free and happy life. Here Hannah, in let me, these are amazing things. I mean, you see things, and instead of just rolling your eyes or tweeting about it, you step in and do things. You raise money. You hire lawyers. You take out ads on buses. When, when the metro lines say we're not putting them out, you sue. Where do you get the courage and where do you get the, the know-how? I mean, I think most people would say, I don't want to get involved. I don't need the vitriolic response. I mean, the amount of abuse you take publicly would scare most people away. Where did this come from inside of you? Were you an activist in an earlier phase of your life or was this just your moment? Haha. <laughs> um, it's an excellent question. I don't do a lot of self-analysis, Ezra. Uh, but I can honestly say that I love my freedom. I love my freedom. I love my life. I've always loved my life. I assumed my freedom. Uh, previous to 9-11, I was the quintessential New York career girl. I loved my job. I loved my fashion. I loved my music, my art. Um, I loved my life. And I never thought that my freedom would ever be uh, in, in, in jeopardy, ever. Mm. And so that's the impetus behind all of this. It's a love of life. It's a love of individual rights. It's a love, the ability to choose, to make mistakes. Uh, you know, uh, without anybody telling me that what I can and cannot do. Um, the, the, it seems to me that the scorn and derision that's heaped upon me on a daily basis is indicative of just how bad things are. Mm. Because I'm fighting not for any one person. I'm fighting for all people. I'm fighting for individual rights under the law. I don't believe in uh, special rights for special classes. I don't believe in supremacism in any way. So it's a knee-jerk reaction to me. I don't know that there's a choice. Mm. You're to amazing. Me, people say, oh, how could you do this? How could you do this? How could you not do it? Mm. Well, What's the alternative, Ezra? Really? I tell you, you're an inspiration. Pamela Geller, a woman of valor, the best of America. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Ezra.